Section 18 of Birds and Nature, Volume 9, Number 2, February 1901. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. Fishes and Fish Culture Among the Greeks and Romans Greek mythology shows us that for a long time, perhaps many centuries, the ancestors of the Greeks knew but very little about the sea or about rivers. The numerous monsters of the sea, products of the imagination, combined in their forms the parts of marine and land animals, including man. The angry waves suggested to them some creature that was wrath. In the ocean depths, what more likely to be found than the caverns empty and dry, the homes of the monsters with which they had peopled it? Their knowledge of the sea was of very slow growth. It was yet a divine thing in Homer's time, who lived just before the dawn of history. Their knowledge of marine life had made but little, if any greater advance, than their knowledge of the sea itself. The people of Homer make no use whatever of fish. We do not find a word indicating that either noble or slave ate fish, although the bill of fare in the Homeric household is given to us with considerable fullness. Passing over two centuries or more to the Athens of Pericles' time, we will find that a great change has been wrought. Fish is now the daintiest viand that comes into the Athenian market. The fishing industry has developed and grown to immense proportions. The fishmonger has taken on a character which seems destined to be eternal. Till this day it has suffered no change except that he has transferred to his wife some of the traits that once were his. The task of supplying the fish market of Athens and other cities must have required a large number of fishermen, for at this time fish might almost be called the national dish, hence an enormous consumption, whereas the means of capture were far inferior to those of today. As a matter of fact, the market was supplied from a very wide area, but chiefly from the seas to the east. Far along the north and south shores of the Black Sea, the industry was a flourishing one. Particularly from these regions were salted and dried fish supplied here they were prepared in the huts of the individual fishermen and were gathered up by the traders who sailed their little boats far and wide in search of traffic the fish were exchanged for merchandise especially for eastern utensils and for clothing these salted and dried fish were the staple varieties and were supplied to the market in great quantities as they were the principal food of the poorer classes and were sold very cheap the hours for the fish market in athens must have been a time of very great interest not only to the athenian householder but to the foreigner sojourning within the city to preserve order and also to give all customers an equal chance to procure the rare specimens offered for sale, several stringent laws were enacted to govern the market. Among other regulations was one requiring the opening of the market to be announced by the ringing of a bell. Apparently there was no fixed moment of time when this bell should be rung, but the time varied little from day to day. If we can believe our ancient authorities, the ringing of the bell was the occasion for a rush, pell-mell, to the market, each seeking to obtain the first choice. Strabo tells us an interesting story anent this custom. On one occasion a musician was performing before a number of invited guests, 
and when in the midst of a composition the bell rang in a moment the guests were up and away to the market all except one man who was deaf when the lyrist had finished he was very careful to thank this lone auditor for his courtesy in remaining to hear him through instead of running away when the bell rang as the rest did oh has the bell rung asked the deaf man and when informed that it had he too hastened to the market the greek interest in fishes seems never to have gone beyond their utility as an article of food the building of aquaria and fish ponds never came to be sport of the greeks although they became extravagant luxuries among the romans likewise fishing never became the sport of a greek gentleman unless perchance at a rather late period plato excludes fishing from the sports of a free-born gentleman the only sport he would have him engage in was the chase which athletic games aside was about the only outdoor sport a greek gentleman seems to have indulged in for instance there is no mention in greek literature of horseback riding as a pastime yet horsemanship was an accomplishment in which every greek gentleman received special training likewise though fishing was not a recognized sport yet the science of angling was well understood among them by the third century b c and probably much earlier this we learn from a beautiful poem by the alexandrian poet theocritus entitled the fisherman i will quote a portion of the poem translated into prose partly because it gives us a picture of some ancient professional fishermen in the camp partly because it mentions all the ancient instruments of the business quote, two fishers on a time two old men together lay and slept they had strewn the dry sea moss for a bed in their wattled cabin and there they lay against the leafy wall beside them were strewn the instruments of their toilsome hands the fishing creels the rods of reed the hooks the sails bedraggled with sea spoil the lines the wheels the lobster pots woven of rushes the seines two oars and an old cobble upon props beneath their heads was a scanty matting their clothes their sailors caps here was all their toil here all their wealth the threshold no door did guard nor a watch-dog all these things all to them seemed superfluity for poverty was their sentinel they had no neighbor by them but ever against their narrow cabin gently floated up the sea End quote. long before daylight one of them awoke and aroused his companion to tell him the dream he had had i shall quote the dream as it graphically describes an ancient angler busy at his task quote, as i was sleeping late amid the labors of the salt sea and truly not too full fed for we supped early if thou dost remember and did not overtax our bellies i saw myself busy on a rock and there i sat and watched the fishes and kept spinning the bait with the rods and one of the fish nibbled a fat one for in sleep dogs dream of bread and of fish dream i well he was tightly hooked and the blood was running and the rod i grasped was bent with his struggle so with both hands i strained and had a sore tussle for the monster how was i ever to land so big a fish with hooks all too slim 
then just to remind him he was hooked i gently pricked him pricked and slackened and as he did not run i took in line my toil was ended with the sight of my prize i drew up a golden look you a fish all plated thick with gold gently i unhooked him then i dragged him on shore with the ropes End quote. i leave to the reader the pleasant task of comparing the ancient tackle with the modern it must be said however that the description is rather ideal for the mediterranean fisherman displays no science in landing his game but simply throws it high and dry or breaks his tackle this fact is well attested for the ancients by several vase and wall paintings portraying fishermen actually at work these paintings show us that the ancient outfit included a basket frequently with a long handle and a vase painting in vienna undoubtedly suggests its use the man has caught a fish which he is lifting straight up out of the water at the same time he is reaching down with his basket evidently to scoop up the fish just before it leaves the water similar to the practice in trout fishing today before passing over the ionian sea to observe what the romans did in this field of activity the quasi-scientific study of fishes among the greeks particularly that of aristotle should claim our attention compared with the work of the moderns aristotle's work was crude indeed estimated as the first attempts at building up a science his work deserves our admiration and in view of the fact that his writings were standard for nearly two thousand years it demands our respect aristotle did his work in natural history under the patronage of king philip of macedon who drew upon the resources of the empire to provide him with rare or little-known specimens from far and wide how some of his conclusions were based on insufficient data and are consequently very inaccurate or even grotesque his discussion of the eel will illustrate it must not be taken as a fair sample of his work in general in fact it is very unusual Quote, among all the animals he says which have blood the eel is the only one which is not born of copulation or hatched from eggs the correctness of this statement is evident from the fact that eel make their appearance in marshy bodies of water and that too after all the water has been drawn off and the mud removed as soon as the rainwater begins to fill these lakes they are not produced in dry weather not even in lakes that never become dry for they live on the rainwater it is therefore plain that their origin is not due to procreation or to eggs in spite of this some people think that they are viviparous because worms have been found in the intestines of some eels which they believe are the young of the eel this opinion however is erroneous for they are produced from the so-called bowels of the earth that is the earthworms the spontaneous product of mud and moisture end quote turning now to the romans we find a somewhat different state of affairs but different only on the aesthetic side from a scientific or industrial point of view the roman though heir to all the greek civilization and learning in this as in many other lines made but slight advances fish culture never became a serious occupation among the romans it was a pastime one of the many directions which their senseless luxury took rather than a carefully directed effort to stock ponds and rear fish for food or as a means of nature study 
the immense ponds were stocked with rare fish in preference to useful varieties next to the rare species those that could be tamed were in favor a qualification of the above statements should be made probably in favor of the romans who lived during the early republican period of whom columella a roman writer has the following to say in his book entitled de re rustica Quote, the descendants of romulus although they were country folk took great pains in having upon their farms a sort of abundance of everything which the inhabitants of the city are wont to enjoy to this end they did not rest contented with stocking with fish the ponds that had been made for this purpose but in their foresight went to the extent of supplying the ponds formed by nature with the spawn of fish by this means the lakes velinus and sabitinus and likewise fulsmensis and ciminus have furnished in great abundance not only catfish and goldfish but also all the other varieties of fish which flourish in fresh water End quote. such were the practices of the roman country folk in early times but strange as it may seem in view of the extravagance of which the fish pond became the object in later times no measures were taken to secure the reproduction and free development of staple food fishes it is well known that the ancients had a remarkable predilection for fish as a food the principal luxury of the roman banquets consisted of fish and the poets speak of sumptuous tables spread with them exclusively in the period between the taking of carthage and the reign of vespasian this taste became a perfect passion and for its gratification the senators and patricians enriched by the spoils of asia and africa incurred the most foolish expense thus licinius morena quintus hortensius and lucius philippus spent millions on their fish ponds and in stocking them with rare species lucullus was by far the most extravagant of these fish fanciers a fish pond was to him very much what the yacht is to the modern millionaire it is his name that we find so frequently in cicero's letters when he and his set come in for several cleverly framed rebukes no matter says cicero about the state if only their fish ponds escape harm it was lucullus who had a channel cut through a mountain at an immense outlay of money in order to let salt water into his fish ponds we are told by varro that one hirius had an income of nearly seven hundred thousand dollars from his roman real estate and spent the whole amount on his fish ponds some of these fish ponds were very elaborate they were constructed with many compartments in which they kept the different varieties the care of these ponds and the feeding of the animals required a large force of trained men and assistants who we can infer learned a great deal about the habits of fishes their favorite food and how to propagate them but their information was never reduced to anything like a science that foolish extravagance of the roman nobles produced but two results the less of which was the impoverishment of some of rome's wealthiest families the other and more unfortunate result was the destruction of the fishes along the mediterranean sea probably the sole contribution to fish culture resulting from all this extravagance was the introduction of goldfish into an artificial habitat and providing them shellfish for nourishment in conclusion i will note some of the forms that were most popular among the romans either for table use or for the aquarium 
for these we are indebted to a mosaic discovered in pompeii they are formed as they were seen by the artist in an aquarium but in the mosaic they are supposed to be seen as if in the sea the varieties found are the gray mullet electric ray gilt head murena scorpion fish crawfish devil fish dogfish red mullet bass spinola red gumara notice prawn and from other mosaic may be added the soft prawn squid and some other species whose english names i do not know t louis comparet end of section eighteen section nineteen of birds and nature volume nine number two february nineteen o one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by avai in july two thousand seventeen section nineteen cinnamon kinamumum cassia blume cinnamon and ginger nutmegs and cloves and that gave me my jolly red nose ravenscroft deuteromela song seven sixteen o nine the cinnamons of the market are the inner barks obtained from trees of tropical countries and islands the plants are quite ornamental twenty to forty feet high smooth enduring green simple and entire leaves the flowers are small and very insignificant in appearance cinnamon is an old-time highly priced spice it is mentioned in the herb book of the chinese emperor sheng nun two thousand seven hundred b c where it is described under the name kuei from china it was introduced into egypt about one thousand six hundred or one thousand five hundred b c the cinnamon and cassia mentioned in the bible were introduced by the phoenicians about four hundred or three hundred b c cinnamon still belonged to the rarities of the market and little was known regarding its origin and cultivation plinius states that it was not a native of arabia but does not explain what its native country was about the fourth century of our era cinnamon found its way into turkey and asia minor where it was employed as incense in church ceremonies in the sixth century chalianus recommended the still very expensive spice for medicinal purposes during the tenth century the price of this article became much reduced and it was used as a spice principally in the preparation of fish meats in england it was used in veterinary practice although china is undoubtedly the home of the cinnamons they were apparently entirely overlooked by marco polo the eminent traveller and historian who visited the greater part of china oil of cinnamon was prepared as early as fifteen forty there are several varieties of cinnamon upon the market cassia cinnamon which is a chinese variety is obtained from cinnamomum cassia the bark is quite thick and contains only a small amount of volatile or ethereal oil it is of little value yet it is exported on a large scale it forms the cheap cinnamon of the market there are other chinese cinnamons of good quality which constitute the principal commercial article the saigon cinnamon is by far the best article it also is chinese obtained from an undetermined species it is the strongest and spiciest of the cinnamons and it is the only variety official in the united states pharmacopoeia the bark is of medium thickness deep reddish brown and rich in volatile oil the ceylon cinnamon from india is noted for the delicacy of its flavor but it contains comparatively little volatile oil the bark is very thin and of a lighter brown color than that of the saigon cinnamon nearly all of the cinnamon of the market is obtained from cultivated plants there are large plantations in southeastern china cochin china india sunda islands sumatra java and other tropical countries and islands 
in many instances little or nothing is known regarding the cultivation collecting and curing of cinnamons as a rule the trees are pruned for convenience in collecting the bark in the better grade cinnamons the bark from the younger twigs only one and a half to two years old is collected this is removed in quills the outer corky inert layers being discarded and dried as the drying proceeds the smaller quills are telescoped into the larger for convenience in handling packing and shipping the color changes to a reddish brown and the aroma increases two crops are collected annually one the principal crop in may and june the second from november to january the blossoms are formed during may and june and the fruit ripens in january these periods correspond to the periods of collecting the older dry corky bark should not be collected as it contains little volatile oil in all carefully prepared cinnamons the outer bark layers are removed by scraping cinnamon is quite frequently adulterated poor qualities are substituted for good qualities or added to the better qualities this applies especially to ground cinnamon cinnamon is one of the richest of the spices its flavor is quite universally liked it is employed in pies and other pastry in drinks in the preparation of hair oils and hair tonics in confectionery with pickles etc etc medicinally it is employed as a corrective in dysentery and in coughs the excessive consumption of spices cinnamon included is a pernicious practice as may be gathered from the opening quotation from ravenscroft spices cause pathological changes in stomach the liver and other glandular organs in particular quite frequently those addicted to the use of spices are also addicted to the use of alcoholic drinks and it is more than likely that the jolly red nose referred to was caused by the alcoholic stimulants rather than the spices the not fully matured flowers are known as cassia buds and are used as a spice they are not unlike cloves in appearance the roots of the various cinnamon trees yield camphor the leaves yield volatile oil and the seeds a faintly aromatic fat albert schneider end of section 19「Section 20 of Birds and Nature, Volume 9, No. 2, February 1901. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. At Dusk Dark shadows fall upon the earth, cool vapors rise in air. The screech owl in the copse is heard, the bees are freed from care. The butterfly has closed its wings. The lark has gone to rest, the nightingale in treetop sings, to sleep the crow thinks best. The lightning bug glows in the brake, the cricket chirps beneath the stone, the whip-poor-will is yet awake, the bullfrog calls in deep low tone. The flowers droop their weary heads, the leaves are nodding in the breeze young birdlings sleep in downy beds squirrels are resting in the trees the bats are flying low and high the fishes rest in waters deep the red has gone from western sky all nature soon will be asleep albert schneider End of section 20. This recording is in the public domain. End of Birds and Nature, Volume 9, Number 2, February 1901.